You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. My guest today is Martin Gurry. He is the author of The Revolt of the Public and the Crisis of Authority in the New Millennium. Martin, welcome to Economics Detective Radio. Thanks, Garrett. Happy to be here hawking my wares. Yeah, so um, your your book is interesting because um, it uh, it was released in 2014, and if one didn't know that, uh, you, you might think it was a book about uh, the rise of Donald Trump and Brexit, sort of in in reaction to uh, to the the sort of the things that started happening around, or that we that many people started noticing around 2016, and and yet uh, the original edition of your book came out two years before that, which and many people, uh, including Arnold Kling, who wrote the foreword to your new edition, have have said that your book was in a way prophetic uh, of events of 2016. Um, so, so give me the, the elevator pitch. What, what is your book about? Well, it's a, it, it's a title and a subtitle that adds up to a, a long spiel. It's The Revolt of the Public and the Crisis of Authority in the New Millennium. And essentially, it's a story about a conflict that pits, or a collision, you might say, a conflict or a collision that pits information wielded by uh, ordinary people against power represented by the elites who run the the great institutions uh, of the modern world. This, to go back to the the publication history that you mentioned, this conflict was kind of apparent to me. And and I don't know if uh, you know my background, but I I was a a CIA analyst. We could get into that a little bit uh, more if you want later. Um, so there were several of us uh, who were sitting in the in the corner, uh, the analytic corner of CIA where I was at, that could see this coming in terms of forces that uh, that information had unleashed, uh, that, that were just creating a great deal of turbulence all around the world. So the book was published in 2014 because we seem to see, I seem to see a revolt happening all over, all over uh, in, in very many countries, let's say, that most people seemed unaware of. Uh, of course, with 2016, Brexit, Trump, uh, the revolt of the public came to the forefront. I would say that 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 I'm sort of a Trump profiteer. Uh, the, the book sold tremendously after he was elected because people wanted an explanation of what had happened. But we are still left with a crisis of authority. And I think that's still something that needs to be um, looked at more closely, defined, and, and researched more deeply. And uh, if we want to get beyond it, uh, we have to uh, un- understand how how and why it has come upon us. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting to sort of step back from day to day, you know, Trump said this, or here's what's happening in, in, in politics of in the last five minutes, kind of looking at the path of modern day politics. It's interesting to take a step back and look at it from from a you know ten thousand foot view, and and say okay, what's the broad pattern? What what are historians a thousand years from now going to say about this period in history? You know what what are the thing the broad trends and forces that are that are driving all these idiosyncratic things? We mentioned Brexit, we mentioned Trump, and your book, of course, talks about the Arab Spring as well as part and parcel of the same pattern. Do do you want to? Uh, well, do you want to comment on on that? Sure. Um, I mean, when you talk about this conflict, it's it's almost hard not to point to a country where it isn't happening, right? I mean, I hope we can talk about Europe sometime during this conversation. But mm-hmm. um, just to take a minute and and focus on the U.S. and again, without being political and and honestly, as I say in the book, I, I'm I, I, history is my my background. I was a history major. Um, but I'm not interested in what people are going to be saying a thousand years from now. I'm interested in how we get beyond this present moment that we seem to be stuck in the muck in. Mm-hmm. And so you do have to step back to do that, because I think many of the attention-getting objects, and, and I put Donald Trump probably as number one, but there are many, many others, tend not to be the causes of, of uh, what, what has put us where we are. They're more like effects. So um, 
If you look at the U.S., I mean, everywhere you look, just turn around. Uh, every institution that we have inherited from the industrial age is in crisis, every one of them. Uh, the elites who run these institutions are distrusted and, and, and more despised. Uh, you go back to John F. Kennedy's time, and when people were asked whether they trusted government, regularly, faithfully, between 70 and 80 percent would say, yeah, of course. Today, um, it's between 20 and 30 percent. For Congress, it's in the teens. Um, and this isn't an American predicament. It's global and it's secular. Uh, like I said, I hope we can talk about Europe. And it's not about government either. It's every great institution, uh, including, for example, media. Trust in uh, the news is also below 30%. So the days when a journalist, for goodness sakes, an anchorman, could be voted the most trusted person in America, those days are, are long gone. So you have to ask yourself, what happened? What changed? Yeah. Yeah. So um, your blog, which is connected to the book, is called The Fifth Wave. Right. Uh, do you want to say what, what, uh, what you're referring to? What, what is a, a wave in this context? Well, my thesis, of course, is that the turbulence that is so apparent to anyone paying attention today is caused by what I call a, a tsunami of information, a gigantic wave. Uh, there has been one obvious change between JFK's time and ours. The, the, the amount of information available to ordinary persons has multiplied almost to infinity. So if you look at the history of information, you see that it doesn't just kind of go steady state. It, it, the technology of information expands in pulses. Uh, and each pulse obviously has a tremendous social and political impact. So if you invent writing, hieroglyphs, pictographs, whatever, you need a Mandarin class to be able to interpret those very complicated uh, ways of, of, of writing out information. If you develop the alphabet, you make possible the classical republics, for example, Greece, Rome, uh, doesn't mean that the alphabet invented democracy in Athens, but it would have been very difficult to obtain it without a, at least a partially highly literate population, uh, which would not have been the case without the alphabet. The next, the next wave was probably the most disruptive of all, it was the printing press. And all I'm going to say is American Revolution, French Revolution, and the Scientific Revolution, which could not have happened just with manuscripts. Next wave was the mass media wave, and we can talk about that because that's the one that's being overthrown as we speak. The current wave is a digital wave, and here's the thing about it. It's early days. I can't say that it's the most disruptive. Like I say, in my opinion, the printing press, I mean, it's hard to beat the American and French Revolution side by side, okay? Um, but it's early days for this one, and but it is, without question, a gigantic um, change in volume in the volume of information. Um, and all these pulses, when you look at the actual total amount of information, and there are experts who have done that, all the way back to the cave painting days until about 20 years ago, it was growth, but it was very slow. It was very incremental. It was uh, very stately. Uh, and then around the turn of the new millennium, things went crazy. When you look at the year 2002, the amount of information produced in that year doubled all of previous history. When you look at the year 2003, it doubled 2002. That trend has more or less continued. If you chart this trend, it does look like a gigantic wave. It, it's a, it, it has that look to it. It looks like a tsunami. Uh, and if you've read the book, you know that that, that chart is in the book. And I, I mean, I, I firmly believe that if you stare at that chart uh, long enough, you see everything that is around us. You see the revolts, the repudiations, the Arab Springs. You even would see, if you look hard enough, uh, Mr. Donald Trump. It is hard for me to see how you can stare at that chart without thinking, how can human relations and institutions based on the old industrial model survive a battering from this monster? And the answer is... So far, they have not been able to. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the not it's not just the volume of information, but uh, a point that you you make in maybe not these exact words is that 
it's where the information is coming from. So thinking back to the, those waves, it seems like some of them were about sort of one-way communication, you know, from the elites to everyone else, such as the the invention of radio in particular. Uh, there's a hy- hypothesis in history that uh, the invention of radio was was responsible for the rise of totalitarian states in you know in fascist Italy and Germany and the Soviet Union and and even uh you know having someone like FDR in the United States have more presidential terms than anyone else that was in a time when the information technology was this was this one way communication from the state to everyone else and that gave them tremendous power whereas something like the printing press uh had many people publishing information from all corners people people like martin luther right. uh shaking things up and the internet really seems more like that printing pre- press innovation than the the radio innovation um do you want to comment on that yeah i mean uh, that's the crisis of authority and i will get into it in, in a sec mm-hmm. but i mean uh, a funny a funny aspect of history is when you look at the response of the elites to the printing press was very similar to what it is to the the digital uh, universe. It was like, why are these people even allowed to talk? And by the way, yeah, when Martin Luther publishes his theses, okay, well, this is a serious person. But uh, of course, one of the effects of um, of the printing press was a tremendous explosion in pornography, which is uh, almost inevitable, and in a lot of quackery, being people who really didn't know what they were talking about, but thought they did. So um, the elites were shocked and horrified at this and thought, why are they even being allowed to talk? So that is the crisis of authority is the collision between the industrial structures we have inherited from an earlier time and the digital dispensation that has grown uh, tremendously since the turn of the century. The, The industrial structures are all top down and it's not just government. It is the corporations, it is journalism, it is the scientific establishment, uh, it is the arts. Uh, it is pretty much every institution uh, that we have inherited is top-down, hierarchical. There's a top dog, and then there's some intermediate dogs, and there's some bottom dogs, and they all have fancy titles, and they all sit in offices, and they pass. everything comes down from the top. Uh, It's all very highly structured. It's like all bureaucracies, and I worked in one, so I I can tell you this is the the way it works. It's accreditation, and all the signals that mean you belong are very important. Being an outsider means I don't listen to you, because why should I? You haven't done what it takes to cross inside the line of of, of my attention. So this is a very structured, uh, um, very slow-moving, very ponderous, very... Institutions like these love five-year plans and, and strategic plans, and they think ahead, they, they, they believe. And, and they have encountered these network, the, net, the network public. And, and the public is, is what has changed. Uh, the public is now the producer of information. In the old days, these institutions, each of them owned a little domain of information. If you're a government, you had your secrets and you you had certain diplomatic uh, exchanges that nobody else had access to. If you were a scientific establishment, you sat on your data. If you were a journalist, you, had a, you, you sat on your access and reports. There was nothing to compare that with. Today, of course, there is a, that, that tsunami has just swept that away. For any domain of information, the public is there and there are people talking about it. And whether they're correct or incorrect, fake or true, which is a big discussion nowadays, um, it's there. It, it no longer is that semi-monopoly of information available. And so what it was implicit trust in the days of JFK. JFK went into the Bay of Pigs as a very inexperienced president, made a, a few blunders. It was a, a, a true humiliation for him, okay? And the result of that was his popularity went up and trust in government went up because I think everybody rallied behind him. There was an assumption that we trust this man because he is our president. I mean, Obama tried to pass um, the health care reform and it spawned the uh, Tea Party. I mean, immediately within a year of his being elected president. 
Donald Trump got elected and he had people yelling at him and telling him to get out before he even had taken over. So being president today is it is being distrusted. You you have the reverse of authority. You have you are you, you are the object of great cynicism and distrust. And, and to me, the, the key element of that is that informational element. The, the fact that you no longer have the monopoly in I'm going to tell you, for example, that. Uh, uh, Pearl Harbor was a day of infamy, and that's what it's going to be. So the, the elites used to tell us what thing, what events meant. It was a day of infamy. Well, you could very well, well make the case that Pearl Harbor was a day when the U.S. got caught with its pants down in the Pacific, but that's not the way we thought of it because the president told us, no, no, it's a day of infamy. We have to now somehow make this right. That kind of authority that uh, a JFK or, or a Franklin Roosevelt uh, could wield just institutionally, because they were the precedent, not only does not exist today, but I think quite the opposite exists. If you are the precedent, you are the object of a great deal of distrust. Right. And yeah, it it seems like if you had said, uh, you know, five years ago that, or or let's say more than five, let's say 30 years ago, uh, that, uh, you know, we would, we would be sort of overthrowing the elites or you know the the people would gain more power at the expense of the elites i think most people would have seen that as a good thing we have a sort of rosy tendency to look at the public and and think like you know if only the these elites are in doing all these things i don't like and if only the people would rise up they'd do exactly the things that i like but uh we've kind of i think learned our lesson that you know the 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 elites are are often bad and the public is often bad and sometimes they can be good but but you can go to these extremes where uh where you have sort of very erratic uh behavior by the public you know uh or or sort of totalitarian control by the elites and somewhere in the middle is a a good society but it's not it's not clear uh you know what what's the the magic formula for finding it yeah, maybe we can talk about. I, I am not. I, I never pose uh, uh, as as a doctor of of our social and political problems. I don't have the wisdom for that. But you can always mm-hmm. talk. And I think part of what I think my framework that I propose of the revolt of the public should serve as is sort of like a a doctor's diagnosis. In other words, uh, this is this is what we're dealing with in terms of the malady the predicament that we're caught in. Uh, and that should, by itself, point some ways of of how we can how we can work our way out of it. Now, you brought up the public. You talked about the elites. It's pretty important to that. I, tr- I try to come to terms in the book with what I mean by the public, and it's it's not an easy concept. Uh, the answer is, is is not as simple as you might think. I talk about in the book what the public is not. It's not the people, for example though it, it often claims to be. It's not the masses. That's a very 20th century concept. It's not the crowd on the street, although the public and the crowd have an intimate relationship. And as a day of social media, it's becoming almost real-time intimacy. It's kind of like they say in the Facebook, it's complicated. So in the end, I went with a, a definition that um, a very wise writer of uh, the, the 1920s Walter uh, Whit Lipman uh, provided, and he said, if I may quote him, the public is not a fixed body of individuals. It is merely the persons who are interested in an affair and can affect it only by supporting or opposing the actors. Now, of course, today, the public has become one of the most powerful actors in the political stage. That is essentially a thesis of my book. But if you pay attention to, to Lipman's definition, you'll see that the public isn't one, it's many. Talk about people who are interested in an affair as the affair changes. So does the public change? Um, so I, I should rightfully say if I were uh, obsessively accuracy-minded publics, but that sounds terrible, so I don't. There is in the publics, in the public, uh, a certain set of uh, characteristics that have developed that seem to hold whether we're talking about 
Occupy Wall Street, the Yellow Vests in France, um, the, the Tea Party, uh, all the movements that that rock the Middle East that go under the the kind of now sad name of the Arab Spring, and that is that the public, when it 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 seems to rise up, usually on a digital platform, and then crosses into the streets, uh, seems uninterested is uninterested in positive programs. It is united because these are people who tend to actually be very divided ideologically. If you were to press them, what do you believe should be done? There would be a babble of voices, but they find some object of negation, some object of repudiation in the system, and that seems to unite them. So the public is simply against. That is the, the, the um, what you were talking about, the fact that we can't just say, well, it wouldn't be great if the public took over. Well, the public is not interested in taking over. It has absolutely no interest in, like in the olden days uh, of uh, revolutionary ideas that you overthrew the government, you took it over, and now you were in charge. The public has no interest in this. It is simply against. It points to things that it dislikes and wants it fixed by somebody, usually the same government that it despises so much, which is very contradictory. So... um, this, of course, this, this, this impulse to negation, to repudiation, can tip over into a nihilism, just a, an impulse to smash at institutions and batter at the elites, which is considered to have failed and self-serving and corrupt without any kind of alternative in mind. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm reminded of, um, there's a, I believe, a sociologist named Vilfredo Pareto around the turn of the previous century Mm -hmm. uh and he had this concept of the circulation of elites the idea that uh you it was never a revolution was never um the people taking over power from the elites it was always a substitution of one set of elites for some other set of elites and when you think about it you know it it can't uh it can't not be be that way you know there's when we say that you know the the people rose up and and took over what what we mean is that a small group much smaller group uh who claimed to speak for a large group of the public or the people or the workers or some specific class took power with the support of uh some some body of of the the public or a specific class and uh and but then once that happens um with this crisis of authority, uh, the the people who are now in charge now face the same problems that led to the the uh, that led to them coming to power, and and now they have have the same troubles that their predecessors had. Yeah, I I hundred percent agree with what you said in the sense that you cannot have any kind of human group that is not essentially managed by. A subset of that group, an elite. The the difficulty we have today, the predicament we find ourselves in, is the public is completely embedded in digital behaviors. The public can, for example, get a date. A member of the public can get a date at the speed of light just by by clicking, or you can buy a car at the speed of light. You can buy almost anything at the speed of light. You can communicate with anybody anywhere in the world at the speed of light. And and that that creates a certain expectation. Also, you go into Amazon and you get something, and Amazon immediately says, here's something kind of like that that other people are buying. Isn't this interesting? And you feel like here's an outfit that is um, minding your tastes in a personalized way, not as just uh, a number. Then you crash into elites who are very, very deep into top-down industrial era, ponderous, hierarchical, bureaucratic modes. And I do think that there is no way to solve that dilemma, that conflict, that collision, until we get elites that get the, um, the digital dispensation. And that seems to be nowhere true. I don't know what it is about that industrial uh, mood of being at my own semi-cynical guess is that it feels very good to sit at the top. And you know, but basically, the, the more you digitize uh, an institution, the flatter it's going to get. Um, and that feels good for the people at the bottom, but probably not so great for people at the top. 
So, um, but in, until you get an elite class, and elite classes, as you say, uh, can be replaced. And I think ours actually is in, in, in process of being replaced. I think part of the, this, the shrieks of horror that you hear today, and um, I mean, practically uh, every commentator that I am aware of uh, every so often needs to open a window, get out the, get out, they stick a head out and say the world is ending somehow. I think that is, those are the, the screams of pain from an elite class that is slowly but surely seeing itself being replaced. It's hard to pinpoint that. I don't have a whole lot of evidence, uh, but certainly the coalition, uh, they, they realize that the, the authority they once had is now gone. And I suspect uh, much of what uh, the behaviors they prize, the, the distance that I stand at the top of the pyramid and I wave at you deplorables down below, um, I, I, I suspect they see that as going away too. And, and that, that generates a lot of hysteria. So uh, you, you mentioned Europe earlier, and uh, mm -hmm. I, I haven't forgotten. Uh, we yeah. said we'd come back to it. So um, how does Europe fit into your thesis? Well, I mean, it's it is almost what if you see what's happening in France over the last five weeks. If I had honestly, if I if I had gone into a laboratory and stitched together a kind of like a Frankenstein's monster of um of it, the public in revolt, as I describe it in the book, these movements that represent the public in revolt, something very like those yellow vest uh, people would have come lumbering out of the lab. Okay, it. Practically every country in Europe is in in a deep, deep crisis of authority. The elite class, I think, there even more than here, is in panic mode. Uh, the Europeans have always, I think, been more elite-led than, than the U.S. And so the loss of that authority, I think, is felt more keenly over there. But if you look at France, of course, Macron, The Economist had a cover of Emmanuel Macron, president of France, uh, walking a water not that long ago, okay? Uh, he was going to be the man who had, was going to solve the riddle for the elites. His popularity is now down to about 23%, uh, and it's doubtful whether he can recover from, from this crisis. I mean, he may linger in power because he's, he's an elected president, uh, and he's got many years left to run on his term, but as a, an active political driver uh, of events, he may be finished. He may be finished. Well, that's, that depends. We'll have to wait and see. But he, he certainly uh, has been dealt a blow. Uh, you look what's happening to um, Angela Merkel in, in Germany. Um, she also, when Trump was elected, was the, the desperate American elites declared her uh, leader of the free world. Then she went into an election in which both her party and the other mainstream party, the Social Democrats, were essentially reamed. Uh, and um, uh, the electorate split and splinter along many different lines, including some very populistic ones. She has now resigned as party leader, and basically uh, it's a question mark how much longer she's going to be able to stay as chancellor. Um, you can just go down in Italy. There are two populist parties that are completely outside the mainstream of Italian politics. Cats and dogs, I mean, two very different uh, populist parties. Nobody thought they could get together. They have. They have made a government out of it. They're fighting with the uh, European Union all the time about it. They are, one, one of them, uh, the, the League, is uh, like an uh, Italian version of Donald Trump. They, they don't like immigration. They want to stop it. And um, when you look at them, as opposed to Macron, who's at 23% approval, they are very popular. It's probably the most popular government in, uh, in, in, in West Europe. So as you can see, the, this coalition is, is, is roiling in Spain. Every time they have an election, they are so fractured that they, um, kept, it takes them months to put together a government. That happened to the Germans too. Um, the public in places like uh, Catalonia and Scotland is hacking away at the ties that bind the nation state. So even whole nations may start to disintegrate. Europe is, is in a bit of trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, that's understatement. Uh, and uh, I, I should make a note for listeners that we're recording this in December of 2018. So if you're listening from the future, <laughs> uh, we're referring to the current events of uh, just up to December 2018. And uh, you, you maybe know more about how this developed. 
so I, I mean, it's interesting with the rise of sort of uh, splinter movements outside of the mainstream in Europe. One factor uh, is that a lot of European countries, including Germany, have pr- some form of proportional representation uh, in in their voting systems. Uh, so in in the United States, if a group like the the uh, Occupy Wall Street or the Tea Party or the uh, alt right or any any of these groups they can rise up and you know mount a protest and you know and may, maybe they can uh push for a you know some candidate to run for one of the major parties uh but the first past the post voting system keep, keeps their keeps them from getting their getting actual seats in government uh, although they have influence in other ways, whereas in in Europe you can you can have five uh, percent of the vote and get five percent of of the seats, and so have a more uh, have gain power in a more official capacity. Um, do you do you want to comment on on how how that dynamic is is different between Europe and the United States? Yeah, I, I actually don't think it is. Um... I think on on the one hand, a lot of these groups uh, are not interested in gaining power. The uh, the French yellow vests they are not interested in in in, uh, in, in uh, gaining power. They are almost exactly what I described in the abstract, which is people from very many different walks of life in, in small town and rural France who have very many different political beliefs. Many of them are on the right. Many of them are on the left. But they are powerfully unified against not just the government, but the system, and not just the system, but poor Emmanuel Macron, the president. So um, the fact that they have no representation, um, it, to them, it's not what matters. They, they are out basically to achieve one end, and that's to, to get Macron either broken or, or gone, resigned. I mean, basically, they keep asking for him to resign. That almost certainly is not going to happen, but who knows these days. And on the flip side of that, of the representative uh, uh, votes, um, uh, proportional votes, uh, you have Brexit. I mean, you had in Britain, which is not proportional, uh, and you had the public win an election, and you had the United States, and you had Trump, and you had a person who basically represented the the forces of anti-elites win a presidential election. So I, I I don't think proportional or non-proportional and who gets represented in the government under these very strange conditions that, that represent our, our predicament today uh, are, are that significant. They probably matter some, uh, but I don't think they're that significant. I think that the significant uh, part is the attitude of the elites and the ability of the public to erupt out of nowhere, as it always seems to, to the elites to basically keep the political landscape in, in terrible turbulence. So uh, there's another aspect to this, to um, the form of modern communication, and, and that is that uh, it, it allows elites uh, and, and others, just communicators, people who uh, deal in information, to say different things to different groups. Uh, so with, with something like Brexit, there was a, it was a, coalition of you know people who wanted to cut down on immigration with people who were worried about british sovereignty with uh you know people with probably very different concerns and um in the age of the internet you can you can do a you know you can have a different conversation with each different group and frame things differently and they won't necessarily hear what you're saying to some other group Whereas with in the age of uh, the radio and uh, and television, you you said the same thing to everyone, and uh, it, it might it, it wouldn't give you the power to individually appeal to different groups uh, in quite the same way. Do you think that's a factor in in current the current events? Well, I mean, I think there's always an element of that in all politics, but I think no, I actually. I think the way, uh, and I think you you characterize the Brexit electorate the same way I would. So to me, it was accurate. 
I think what happens is less that people get appealed to their um, their own peculiar, you know, tastes and 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 twitches, um, and more that that powerful uh, feeling of negation is made uh, by and far uh, the the most important aspect of uh, of whatever it is that they cause. It's a Brexit, so getting out of the European Union. And and so you come up with villains on the other side that people want to stay. Why do I stay in? Well, there's all kinds of villains. And you generate a lot of negation, a lot of hostility, a lot of anger, a lot of against, a lot of anti. And everybody with their different motives for voting uh, against uh, the EU, voting for Brexit or leave, blend into that that negation pretty seamlessly. They don't have to be pitched at their own little particular reasons for doing it. We're all shoulder to shoulder against. Uh, and that seems to be the way uh, these movements have worked uh, from the beginning, from the beginning. It makes them very powerful when they are targeted, uh, as for example, Brexit. And it makes them kind of uh, helpless when they are turned to and, and asked, so what is it that you want? Suppose you were to win. Suppose the government were to turn to you and say, and this has happened, happened in Israel with the tent city protests. It happened in Spain to some degree where the indignados were asked, uh, well, you've got millions of people out on the street, so what is it that you want? And then it was a babble of voices because, in fact, what they, they were united about was they hated the system. They wanted the system changed. But how? Oh, then it was very different. For the, Every person had a different opinion. So... Um, I, I think that's a dynamic that's at play more than uh, it's very hard in the digital age to appeal to somebody and not be found out. In other words, to have some kind of special appeal to say things that contradict each other to different groups, somebody catches you and and finds you out. Um, and I think that the dynamic for these groups tends to be more one of of uh, anti against negation. Um, uh, the, go all the way back to Tahrir Square, the the insurgency, the street revolt against uh, Hosni Mubarak in, in in Egypt. I mean, that revolt was almost determinative in having Mubarak resign. But the second Mubarak resigned, what happened? The people that were on on uh, Tahrir, uh, Tahrir Square dissolved into twenty or thirty different uh, groups of babbling voices, and old institutions, the Egyptian army, the Muslim Brotherhood took over all the political space that had been opened. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's uh the the phrase the enemy of my enemy is my friend seems very relevant uh yes. that pe- people are really good at allying against the things they hate but uh v- really bad at all- allying for the things they like and it kind of relates to the nature of how things go viral that something if something's an outrage and uh you know and it makes you angry and it's you know very bad and everyone can see that it's bad and it had bad outcomes uh that's the kind of thing that goes viral and then leads might lead to protests or um demonstrations or and possibly new political movements but then you know the idea of something good that you want that hasn't happened yet but that uh that you could put into practice that's much less viral much much less potential to uh to form a movement so these movements form around the things that they hate and uh and then they dissolve when they've destroyed the thing they hate and not replaced it with anything yeah that to me is the definition of, of nihilism if you if you break something without any idea in your head of what you're replacing it with you're just a breaker, and not all of the groups are like that. And and the intensity of of negation in different groups it varies a lot. But as a general proposition, that is a characteristic of all of these groups. If you are a yellow vest, you take a hammer to the Arc de Triomphe, the beautiful symbol of of your country, and you vandalize it. You destroy chunks of statuary that's been there for 150 years just because it stands for something you you so deeply despise that system so yeah that that that's i think that's an accurate description of what's going on hmm. yeah it's it's quite uh the problem if i think and i think it uh it relates to sort of a 
a kind of optimism in that in the absence of the things that are making life bad, uh, life would be good. You know, the sort of belief in in utopia is sort of a default state and then specific things that are pulling us away from it, as opposed to a, the more, you know, pessimistic view that the default state is, is bad and we've only managed to have prosperity because of our institutions and, uh, and that by destroying them, you could, you could lose prosperity and, and rather than, you know, get rid of all the bad things and be left with only good, you, you get rid of all, all the all the, th- the institutions and are left with nothing that is 100% correct at least uh, as i understand these these movements and it manifests itself in, in in different ways but one of them is the attitudes of all of these groups to history the idea of utopia as being default uh means of course Anything that isn't utopia is unnatural and is is exploitive and is wrong, uh, and it is the outlook of almost every one of these groups. I can't think of an exception that history essentially is the source of uh, exploitation, of racism, of sexism, of um, government abuse, of depending on which side of the spectrum you're sitting on. Um, history has condemned uh, us to not the, the reason we're not utopia is historical. There's some historical reason. So history is looked upon as a kind of an abomination. And of course, um, history is our memory. So it is faulty and it's biased and, and it's spotty and uh, but it is what we got. And it is kind of fascinating to watch these groups. To me, a, a really extreme example of this is ISIS. ISIS, if you if, if you read the um the speeches or the sermons, I guess they are, of uh of the caliph, the caliph of the caliphate, Al Baghdadi, he it's one big rant about what history has done to 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 the Muslim nation. And of course it was that episode where um a bunch of great big burly bearded guys broke into um the archaeological museum in Mosul, which had been conquered by ISIS, and started literally bashing away at um, ancient statu- statuary. I mean, it was like declaring war in history. Yeah, in a very, very literal sense, uh, destroying in a that literal many sense. thousand year old, you know, Bronze Age uh, mm-hmm. works that yep. predate Islam, and uh, you know, should should be not in con- conflict with it at all, but. Uh, but according to their ideology, they were somehow an, an affront to them and had to be destroyed. Well, as I um, um, briefly touch on uh, in, in the final essay in the book, uh, where I update from 2014, ISIS is the worst case of what happens when nihilism takes over. It was essentially a movement that was deeply against almost everything that it found around uh, in the modern world, and it perpetrated some pretty horrific crimes. And it probably there it's not quite finished yet, although I see we're we're declaring victory. But it it on behalf of this this nihilistic vision uh, that the history had to be somehow extirpated. And we had to go back to the times when um, this particular ideology was supposed to have been triumphant. Um, many tens and maybe even hundreds of thousands of people died terrible deaths. Yeah, and they certainly did not succeed in making uh, making life good, even even probably for the for the people who weren't killed. Maybe even for the people who were in positions of power, it was still just a. a bloody war and now it seems to be concluding isis recently lost their their last major stronghold and uh now it's just left to pick up the pieces uh and it's not clear how how well anyone is going to be able to do that yeah i mean that's that's a separate aspect from uh, from my book but yes i would say that what you have on the wake of, I think the world woke up because everybody's been very passive in the face of uh, this particular um, 
uh, horror. And the world finally woke up and decided that it had to eliminate uh, ISIS. And I think the Europeans and us and others around the region uh, came together to do that and mostly have done it. I'm not sure that's 100% complete, but uh, mostly have defeated that group. But so the question now is, what follows? What is put in its place? And that, of course, in, a, in, a, in an age that, that is a crisis of authority, uh, with that, when that's the, the, the fundamental aspect of, of life, anything you say is going to be questioned. If you say it should be democracy, it's going to be questioned. If you say it's going to be some dictator that's going to be your friend, that's going to be questioned. There is no uh, authority, no elites that can decide that question for us and explain it in a way that's persuasive to the public. So uh, we're coming up on time here. Do you have any closing mm-hmm. thoughts, any any sort of overall message that you want uh, listeners to to get from this whole conversation? Well, I mean, I, I, I get accused of being a pessimist and, and a, a dark prophet. Um, and I, I want to escape that those labels uh, in the end here, if I may. We have said a lot about the public. And um, I stand by everything I said. But um, in the end, when you listen to what the public is saying, and that's true of every one of these movements, they say, no, 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 this is not about us. This is about the elites. So you have to now think about what is the relationship between the public and the elites. And I think in a democratic country, there is a sense, and there, in, in the book I I buttress this argument with uh, an argument from a Spanish philosopher called Ortega Gasset. There is a sense in which the public selects the elites. Um, We are the ones who determine who our rulers are. And not only that, we are the ones who determine, who've watched enough television or news or whatever to decide which which anchormen are going to keep their jobs because they're popular which movies are seen, which actors are uh, getting $10 million per, per picture because we like them so much. So we, in a strange sense, elect our elites. And I would, certainly from the political side, I would put it uh, this way to everybody listening, that we should avoid being told by our politicians the old industrial idea that there is some scientific way that we know the problem and uh, there is a solution. Uh, the, the elites, the industrial elites, like to think mathematically. For every political situation, they see a problem with a single rational solution. And if you want to run for office, that's what you peddle, your solution. And of course, we don't know enough. The human race is just not that wise yet. Uh, when it comes to human relationships and social relationships, it's very complex. So you get elected. And then you can't really, you don't solve anything. You just run around, pass laws or whatever if you're lucky, but there's no real solutions. I would say that as, as members of the public, we should turn to people who tell us, here's something that might work, but we have to do trial and error. And people who are courageous enough to not pretend to knowledge they don't have and who are willing to say, um, well, I was wrong about this. Uh, this, this, uh, I, I attempted this program. It seems not to be working. We've now got to backtrack and try something else, rather than double down. Every failure gets doubled down on. So today, that would be hopeless. So that is something that is um, in the hands of each and every one of us, in the hands of the public, to select the elites who embody real virtues uh, that can get us out of this predicament. So to to summarize. Uh, we, we or to to sort of build on your point you're saying we need to we need to build our institutions in a way that can rebuild the the authority or the the trust people have in those institutions and in the process by which we uh we decide on on policies and and uh social things because the way we currently do it with you know, a set of elites that people don't like or trust, and then, you know, chaos and protests and movements uh, only resulting in another set of elites that we also don't like and don't trust doesn't seem to be working for us. Uh, would Would you agree with that statement? Yes, and I think we are we are sort of stuck in the muck. The public is right now powerful enough 
to paralyze the elites. The elites are terrified. They, they can see what's going on, but they are unwilling to change. Maybe unable, but I suspect unwilling to change. So um, if you want my very brief uh, description of what will happen to get us beyond this, this moment and get us out of the muck, is we will get a different kind of elite. We'll get a, an elite that is tuned into the um, the digital dispensation, I call it. Um, and, and if you ever look at people who are trusted online, they're trusted on a day-by-day -day basis, not because, unlike, say, a CEO or, or a U.S. president who gets the mantle of authority and that's it, you will listen to me because I am the president and you will listen to me for four years regardless. People online have to earn that authority, that re legitimacy, that, that trust on a day-by-day -day basis. We need elites that function like that, not elites that feel like they have an inexhaustible supply of authority that can that they can then abuse any way they want. But it can be done. And I think it's a generational change. And I think it's probably part of the noise that we're hearing right now, all the turbulence. It's a change happening. My guest today has been Martin Gurry. His book is The Revolt of the Public and the Crisis of Authority in the New Millennium, which I'll link to from the show notes page at economicsdetective.com. Martin, thanks for being part of Economics Detective Radio. Hey, Garrett, it was fun. 